Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are we doing today? We are so glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. I hope you're having a blessed Memorial Day weekend. And we want to say that we are thankful for those who have given their lives for our freedom here in this country. We are blessed to be free because of their sacrifice. And uh, I want to say that I'm blessed today to have my son with us on the drums. This is my son Jefferson playing on the drums this morning and my beautiful family here this morning. So I just hope that you're all having a blessed weekend. But we're here today to uh, worship Jesus corporately. And where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is. He's with us this morning. And we just invite you to worship with us. The Holy Spirit's presence is here with us today. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame all it's stealing. Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Sing it with me, he makes a way. He makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can't say. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Tell the past to disappear oh, Let me tell you about my Jesus All the wrong turns that you would Go and undo if you could Who will work it all for your good, yeah Let me tell you about my Jesus He makes a way where there ain't no way Rises up from an empty grave Ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. And the good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 cross to Calvary, pay the price for all my guilty, who would care that much about me, let me tell you about my Jesus, oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way, rises up from an empty grave, ain't no sinner that he can't save, let me tell you about my Jesus, his love is strong and his grace is the good news is I know that He can do for you what He's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus change your life. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. They say this mountain can't be moved They say these chains will never break But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've 
heard that there is no way through We've heard the tide will never change They haven't seen what you can do There is power in your name So much power in your name Move the immovable Break the unbreakable God, we believe, God, we believe for it. From the impossible, we'll see a miracle. God, we believe, God, we believe for it. Yeah. Sing it with me. We hope that hope is For there is still an end to bring. God, we believe. God, we believe no matter what. There is power in your name. So much power. So much power in your name. in you. But not just because there's an empty grave, because this Sunday is Ascension Sunday. This past Thursday was Ascension Day. And it's a moment that we don't think a lot about or talk a lot about around Easter, but it's part of Easter. And it's the full completion, because it's the ascension of the Son to the right hand of the Father, where He is ruling and He is reigning. So our hope and our confidence is in that our Jesus, our Savior is not just, He's not just taken our place on the cross, He's not just raised for the, from the grave that we might have life, but that we have confidence that He is ruling and He is reigning at the right hand of the Father. Whatever you're facing this morning, whatever obstacles seem insurmountable, let that bring you hope. Let that bring you comfort. Let that bring you peace that our Father 
and the Son are there side by side, ruling and reigning. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. Father, we are so thankful. We are thankful for what you've done. We're thankful that you took our place. We're thankful that your, sin, your, your son reconciled us to you, taking on our sin, dying our death so that we might live again, so that we might be raised to new life. We're thankful, we are, and it brings us great hope and great peace to know that you are sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning the king over all, sovereign over all things. Thank you, Father. So this morning, we, we repent. Forgive us for being worried. Forgive us for doubting. Forgive us for being concerned. Forgiving, forgive us for living for our own will and our own desire, Lord. Because the truth is that we're to live for you. We're to live according to your will and your purposes, Lord. Help us to center on that. Help us to focus this morning upon you and you alone. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we bring up the lights, I'd like for everybody to just stand for one moment and roam about the room, shake someone's hand, and uh, welcome them this morning. Who would take my cross to Calvary? Praise the Christ for all my guilty. Who would care? much about me let me tell you about my jesus oh he makes a way where there ain't no way rises up from an empty grave ain't no sinner that he can't save let me tell you about my jesus his love is strong and his grace is free and the good news is i know that he can do for you As we make our way back to our seat, as I usually mention, that's my subtle way of telling you to get back to your seat. If you're still up roaming around loving people, that's enough of that. No, it's, it is a great sight to see when brothers and sisters are loving one another. When we get to fellowship with one another is a sweet moment. I think it's just a little glimpse of maybe what heaven might be like, minus our odors, you know, minus that. Um, it's just a sweet moment of the presence of God. This morning, we're going to continue in our worship through our giving. I like to talk about that a lot in terms of our worship, because I think it's important for us to understand that giving comes from a heart that loves God. We give unto God, not out of obligation, not out of 
requirement, not because it earns us anything, but it is a proof, it is evidence of a heart that loves God. Amen? So as we grow in our love for God and as we grow uh, in, in our walk with Him, an evidence of that, evidence of that heart that's shaped in that way is through our giving. And I also commonly talk about this being a, a, everything that we've been given is a gift from God. All of our strength, all of our energy, all of our resource, everything that we have was given to us by God. The money that you think is yours, the ability that you think is yours, and the thing that you think you've mastered or you've conquered, God was at the center of it. And so we recognize that we are weak and He is strong. He is the great giver of life. He is the provider. Thank you, Lord. As the gentlemen come to take up the offering, I want to lead us in prayer. Father God, we love you. This morning we respond in that way. We respond for the, in the love that you have for us through our love back with our giving. This is one of the many expressions of our love that we have for you, Father. And as your word says, money is an indicator of where our heart is. And so this morning we show, we demonstrate that our heart is in the kingdom. Our heart is for you, Father. And we give back to that this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. I just want to speak in 
within his presence I speak Jesus Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus. Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I prove him more and more Jesus Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that you Oh, hi. 
Praise the Lord. Just take a moment, everyone. Lift your hands toward heaven right now, would you? Come on, there's someone in heaven waiting to hear your praise. There's someone in heaven who longs for fellowship and closeness and intimacy with you. There's someone in heaven who created you for that purpose, placed you on this planet, and has left you here for this length of time that you might give glory and honor to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we bless you today. We thank you for loving us. We give you glory and honor. Thank you, Jesus, that you have ascended to the right hand of the Father. We acknowledge you as King of kings and Lord of lords. For you have rightly won the battle. You have rightly deserved every one of those titles. You've earned them all for yourself. Jesus, you are King of all kings. Jesus, you are Lord of all lords, and we acknowledge you as such today. We thank you that you've allowed us to share with you in this kingdom blessing. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the bounty you've prepared for us. Wonderful table you've prepared in the presence of our enemies. Thank you, O oh God, for your loving kindness, goodness, and mercy. And everybody said amen, amen, amen. God bless you as you're seated. We want to dismiss our children right now, release them to go upstairs, the four through 11-year-olds, all right? So... We need to bring the lights up so they can see where they're going. And all of our kids are going this way. Some are going that way. But we're going to make our make uh, that our resting place, that place up there. That'll be the place for the kids today. And I'm going to say a big welcome home to everybody. Just welcome home. That's the title of my message this morning. Welcome home. Turn to your neighbor and just say, say it out loud. Say, welcome home. Go ahead, tell them. Just say, welcome home. Glad you're here. Welcome home home today. Welcome home today. You know, when the church feels like home, that's when uh, God is blessed and we're blessed. And I believe that the family of God is the most exciting group of people I could ever be with. I love the family of God. I love my, my own, my biological family. But I want to tell you something. There's a family that I'm going to spend eternity with. Not all of my biological family is going to be with me, unfortunately. But I'm going to tell you what, every individual who is born of the Spirit, every individual who has been born again into God's family will be spending eternity together. Can you say amen to that? So when you think of the church as, as family, it changes everything. It changes everything. A home is considerably different than an organization or a company. Um, or a civic organization. There are different priorities in the home and the family than there are in all of these organizations that I've been mentioning just now. For instance, names matter more than numbers in the family. In the family, loving one another comes before loving the lost. We need to love one another before we decide we're going to love the lost. Come on, somebody. Jesus said, how can you love God whom you have not seen when you can't love your brother whom you have seen. It's about loving one another. It's about learning to love the family of God. We care for individuals in the family of God, and that goes against um, uh, a lot of corporate thinking. It goes against uh, uh, the inefficient, it seems like an inefficient way to do, do business, taking the time to love every single individual. But I want you to know something. That's God's heart. That's God's plan. I don't see the church, I don't like love all the church and, and, and not love individuals, not care for individual persons. That's what God's heart is and his desire is that we love individuals. Another thing that uh, demonstrates that we are, uh, the ch when, the, when the church is feeling like home is when we worship as a family. A moment ago we were lifting our voices and we were singing. And I'm telling you what, we are, I know I'm partial, I know I am. But we are so blessed with an incredible group of musicians and singers at this church who lead us every time we get together, every service. They're here faithfully. They've, they've practiced. They've, they've sharpened their skills. You know, Psalm 33 talks about playing skillfully. And they play skillfully on their instruments. They do so for the glory of the Lord. They don't do so for themselves. They don't do so to make a name for themselves. They don't do so to sell albums. They're not in this thing to make money. I want to tell you something. These musicians and singers, they love Jesus, and they want everybody else to love Jesus too. 
So when we come together and we sing with them, we sing with our brothers and sisters next to us and behind us and in front of us, we are worshiping corporately. You see, that's, this is just kind of icing on the cake. What I should be doing is I should be worshiping every single day. A huge portion of my day should be devoted to worshiping Jesus and honoring him. Can you say amen to that? When you learn how to do that, my friend, I'm going to tell you something. That's when life gets exciting. That's when sorrows and difficulties and, and trauma and tragedy just seems to fade away because we're worshiping the king of glory. That's what we do every day. That's what we do every night. But then when we come together on Sundays, oh my goodness, this is not the only time we worship Jesus, but it is a special time to worship Jesus because we're all together. The family has come home for a few moments, a few hours, and we're here to give glory and honor and praise to the King. But we do so with more than just singing, more than just music. Worship is a lifestyle. Can you say amen? Worship is what we do every day. Worship is loving our wife and our kids and our family. Worship is paying our bills. <laughs> Worship is paying our taxes, even when we don't want to pay our taxes. Jesus said, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render unto God the things that are God's. So many of us, we got half of that all messed up. We don't want to render unto Caesar. But I'll tell you, as long as we're under the system, it's, it is necessary to, to honor the laws of the land. When you honor the laws of the land, God honors you because you're showing responsibility. You're showing character. You're showing that you really love Jesus and you're doing so by demonstrating it all in your lifestyle. That's what worship is all about. Listen, worship is not coming and singing a few songs on Sunday morning and living like the devil Monday through Saturday. Come on. Worship is an all day, all week, 24-7 occurrence. It's, it's what we do. It's our, it's our life. We can't help but worship him. Thank you for your enthusiasm on that point. I said we can't help but worship him. Amen. Amen. When we think of the church as home, it changes everything. Because a home is considerably different than an organization or a company or a civic group. I was a Kiwanian for years. I, I belonged to the Kiwanis Club. I liked the Kiwanis Club. I liked them so well. I paid dues and ate, ate the rubber chicken and all that stuff every week at the restaurant where we all met and uh, ate that old food. Why? Because I liked being with those Kiwanians. I enjoyed the fellowship. I enjoyed getting to know people and the projects we were involved in and and so forth. Glenda and I, we, I made it up the ranks, and, and if, you're, if you're absent enough, they will elect you president. And so I missed one particular day, and they, they said, Mickey ought to be the president. And so they made, <laughs> they made me the president. I served a couple of terms as president of our local Kiwanis Club. And, and so Glenda and I got to go to the, the convention, and it just so happened that year the convention was in Las Vegas. I mean, you know, preachers enjoy going to Las Vegas. There's so much for us to do out there. <laughs> so we sat quietly in our room for three days. No, we didn't really. I, we, we went to some shows and we, we attended, you know, some of the conventions I could say I had been there and so forth. But, but I like the Kiwanis Club. I like what they do. I like what they stand for. I, I like the people. But I'm going to tell you something. That doesn't compare with the church, the body of Christ. There are things that we uh, accomplish there that cannot be accomplished you know, anywhere else. But I'm going to tell you, the body of Christ is where things are, are, are happening. This is where I learn to love my brothers and my sisters like I love the Lord Jesus. This is where I learn to forgive. This is where I learn to care for others. I, I've often thought of it as, as God putting us like rocks in an old toe sack. You know, you put rocks in the toe sack and then you throw the toe sack over your shoulder and here you go down the road. And those rocks are bumping with one another and they're grinding and they're, what are they doing? They're knocking off the rough edges. Before you know it, you open up that sack and that rock's not nearly as big as it used to be, but it's refined and, and the rough edges are gone. What's happened? Well, God uses the church like a toe sack to rub some of the rough edges off of us. He teaches us to love the unlovely and love the unlovable and love people we wouldn't normally want to hang with. He teaches us that, that the body of Christ is multi-generational. Listen, I've not been called just to hang out with 65-year-olds in the body of Christ. I've, 
I am called to love the children and love the teenagers and love the moms and the dads and the grandmas and the grandpas and everybody in the body of Christ because, because the home, thinking of the church as home, changes everything, changes my paradigm. Now all of a sudden I'm not thinking of it as a civic organization or not thinking of it as my workplace or not thinking of it as the corporation that I work for or the company that I give my time to. It's the body of Christ, my friend, and it's different than any other entity on the planet. It is the, it is the one organization that Jesus Christ died for. He laid down his life for the church. He gave his life's blood for the church. That's how much he loves the church. The good news is he's coming back for his church one of these days. I said he's coming back in the clouds of glory for his church one of these days. And you know the foolproof evidence of love for Christ is our love for our brothers and our sisters. Everyone has a cell phone handy. Would you take your cell phone out and put it on camera mode? like me, I'm real good at this. And just real quickly, put it on camera mode, there you go. And look up here at the screen and take a photo. Would you do that? Just take a photo of that slide. Click. Okay, has everybody done that? I see some phones out, good, good, good. I wanna take one of this one. This one's easier for me to read back here than that one. There we go, whoa, whoa. Well, well, I've learned to I've learned to touch that one button, uh, and 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 what what it does is uh, is is zooms in and zooms out, and but I've not learned how to go zooming in all the time, Michael. You know what I'm saying? It's like sometimes it doesn't want to go the way I want it to go. There we go. Did everybody click that? Did everybody get a copy of that? I want everyone to have a copy of that slide, and that slide's a good one too. Thank you for that slide. You version the Bible app. Okay, that's good. Thanks, guys. <laughs> you don't ever want to. You don't ever want to make fun of people in the sound booth because they have the ability to cut me off. I mean, I could just be like, and you will know about what I'm trying to. See what I'm saying? But the the foolproof evidence here it is. I want you. I want you to get this. I want you to take it home with you, because the foolproof evidence of love for Jesus Christ is our love for our brothers and our sisters. Do you love one another? as Christ has loved you. Mm. And you see, loving one another comes before loving the lost. The great commandment is that we love God and that we love our neighbor as ourselves. Love God, Jesus said, with your whole heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, your mind, your soul, your strength, everything you've got. Love God, number one. That's your vertical love towards God and then he said the second part of that great commandment is this love your neighbor as yourself that's the horizontal love love your neighbor as yourself if you look at that it's giving you a vertical and a horizontal which is forming a cross and I'm telling you true love is found at the cross where Jesus Christ stretched out his arms and you said well how much do you love us Jesus and he loves said I love you this much right here I love you this much I love you this. Go back to that verse. Would you that John 13 that you popped up there for me? Thank you, Sabrina or Sarah, whoever's doing that for me. You're good. You're awesome. I appreciate it. <laughs> Brag on the sound booth after having given a sarcastic remark about the sound booth. The, 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 the thing is to brag on them. Don't you think that we're doing a wonderful job in the sound booth this morning? I mean, really. I mean, really. I mean, really. They're keeping up with me. They're keeping up with the bass guitar and his vocal. They're keeping up with a, with a, with a track that's run through the, you know, somehow run, I don't know, but then there's the keyboard and her vocal and one, two, three other vocalists and, and Skylar's over here and he's doing the guitar and vocals. Then you've got, you've got microphones on the drums back and they're trying to keep all that straight. So it all sounds good. And I think it sounds wonderful because of our sound booth people. Come on, one more time. Let's tell them we appreciate them, would you? Sometimes we don't, uh, we don't say that we appreciate them as much as we really do. Thank you guys. Here it is, John 13, 34. The old commandment was that you love your brothers yourself. But I want to give you a new commandment, Jesus said. A new commandment is that you love one another as I have loved you. 
wait a minute. So you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is how people are going to know we're disciples of Jesus Christ. This is the, this is the, um, the, 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 the earmark, the, the way that they're going to recognize us. It has nothing to do with shaving your head and wearing a white chiffon robe and going into the airport. They used to let them do that, and go in airports and sell, and sell flowers. You remember those people? Play little tambourines and stuff in the airports? You knew who they were. You knew what, what kind of religion they were. That was their trademark. That, that set them apart. And there are all kinds of things that set people apart in their religions. And Jesus said, well, the way the world's going to know who you are is because of your love for one another. He had just demonstrated to them what true love was. He had just taken off his outer garment, which signified who he was in society. And he looked like everybody else. No one could tell him apart from all the other disciples. Then he put on a towel, which was a symbol of a servant, and he girded himself with a towel, and he took a basin of water, and he got down on his knees and his hands and his knees to do what no disciple had offered to do for any other disciple that night at that dinner. Not a single one of them had offered to wash the other one's feet. No, that's what servants do. We don't do that. I'm not a servant. <laughs> and I'm certainly not going to wash your feet. Because after all, I really would like to have your seat next to Jesus. Whoever said you could sit at his right hand and whoever said you could sit at his left hand, I should be sitting there. I should be the one. He should be talking to me. He should be sharing secrets with me. We, he and I haven't had a chance to talk because of all you guys. It's like 12 of you guys. And everyone's, everyone's crowding in. Everyone's jockeying for position with Jesus. Do you feel that? Do you hear that? Can you see some of that green jealousy just floating through the room? So Jesus says, I'm going to give you guys a new commandment. He didn't just give it to the disciples in that room. He gave the new commandment to you and I. And he said, here's the new commandment. I want you to love one another. And I don't want you just to love one another as you love yourself. That's difficult enough to do because we love ourselves. That's extremely difficult to do. But I want you to take it to a higher level. I want you to love one another as I have loved you. And you're only going to be able to do that when you allow the love of the Holy Spirit to be demonstrated through your life. That's it. That's it. I cannot love you in my own power, in my own ability, in my own strength. I can't do it. I have to have God. Would you agree you have to have God's help to love people? Because how many of you know people aren't exactly lovable? <laughs> They don't always do things the way you want it done. They don't always say the things you want them to say. But Jesus said, I'm going to give you a new command. I want you to love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone's going to know they're my disciples. It's going to be so evident to the world. It was so evident to the first century, through the first century church, that people said of them, they said, Look how they love one another. The world saw it. The world saw the love of God demonstrated through the early church. And they were so drawn to Christ because of that love. You don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you in this room would really like to see the love of God so demonstrated in your life that people were drawn to the cross. People were drawn to salvation. People were drawn to, to an experience with Jesus Christ. Not because they could see him, but because they could see you. Not because they could see his love, but they could see through you the love of Christ demonstrated to other people. My Lord. I said, my Lord. You know, the Bible is full of references like Brothers and sisters. In fact, the word brothers used 600 times in the Bible. In the, in the New Testament, where it really focuses on the church, there are 139 references in the New Testament to the word brother. Brother. 
There's references to God the Father and Jesus as the elder brother and, and God's family. Don't you like that one? God's the family of God. We used to sing an old song when I was a kid coming up. And it went like this. This is the one we would sing when it was meet and greet time, Michael. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain. How many remember that? Cleansed by his blood. Joined heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. The family of God. We should just think about the family of God. And the Bible's full of references to a family. It speaks of a household environment of holiness and spiritual nurturing and security and safety among the brothers and the sisters. And Paul, speaking to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15, said how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God. The household is the church. The church is a household, Paul was saying. In 1 John 4.20, he who does not love his brother cannot love God whom he has not seen Let's look at that. I think I have that verse on the screen for you. 1 John 4, 20, if I'm not mistaken. He who does not love God, whom he has not... How can we, how can we love God whom we have not seen when we don't love our brother whom we have seen? You guys have that? It's 1 John 4, 20. Let's look that one up, everybody. That one's a doozy. There we go. If anybody says, oh, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Oh, he's a liar, does not love his brother. Whom, I mean, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. Where's that camera at? You can see out that camera ready in that phone of yours to take a picture. Might be a good idea to take a picture of this slide. See how quickly this slide. Oh, wait a minute. Where are the, cam where are the cameras at? Oh, I see. This one's a little convicting, is it? Okay. Well, take a picture so you can send it to somebody. There you go. Take a picture and send that to someone, okay? <laughs> the reason I want you to do that is it's quicker than writing it down. And once you've got it in your phone, you can use it. You can post that on Facebook or something. You can, you can text it to a friend. However you want to utilize that verse. What would be really wonderful is if we could apply the verse to our own lives. If you say, I love God and hate a brother, the Bible says you're lying about that. Because if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, you can't love God whom you have not seen. Ephesians 2.19 says we're no longer strangers, but once we're born again, we are members of his household. Members of his household. His oikos. The word oikos is a Greek word which refers to God's people at least 12 times in the New Testament Greek. And uh, particularly Matthew 24, I don't know if we have that verse or not, 24 verse 45, excuse me, 44 and 45. Can you all bring that up? I don't think I have it for you, but let's see what we can do. Matthew 24, verse 44 and 45. An oikos is a, a group of, of people, who, like averaging 12 to 15 people, whom we are in a very, very close relationship with. Okay, everybody has an oikos. Everyone has a sphere of influence. Yours may be larger than 12 to 15. If you're in the kind of job or kind of family that, you know, I know some families where you got more family members than that. It seems like every time Curtis and Susan bring kids and grandkids to church, they fill up a couple of pews. I love it, man. I love it. I love those big families. Don't you love those big families? And so the Bible speaks of the household of God. And uh, let's see, 24, 44, and 45. That looks good. Let's look at the next verse, can we? 45? Hmm. Ah, who, is, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household, or his oikos, to give them their food at the proper time? Okay, I just gave you an example there with Matthew 24, the household of God. But here's an interesting thought about, um, about this, this, word, this word brother. Christ is, Christ is faithful, according to Hebrews 3.6, Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. Did you know that? He is a son over the 
family of God or the household of God. I'm, I'm working on this theme now to welcome you home, to let you know that the church, thinking of, I want you to think of the church as a family. I want you to think of the church as a home. Next Sunday night when we gather down at the 330 building, we're going to have Italian food together. This will be our monthly uh, dinner. We met last month for Mexican food. Man, did we have a great time. I'm really hoping everybody can come next Sunday night, 3.30 billion. We'll be talking more about that. But bring some Italian food. Bring yourself. Bring an Italian friend. <laughs> and let's, let's just gather. Let's be, let's, be a, let's be a family for a little while. Sound good? Let's be the family of God. And so the Bible's full of references. Hebrews 3, 6, Jesus is, Christ is faithful as the sun over God's house. And I want you to notice now the word for son, the word for brother, is the, is the Greek word, it's translated both, both ways, it's a Greek word, adephotes. And it means one born of the same womb. Hold on a second. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, adelphotes in the Greek. And it means one born of the same womb. Oh my goodness. There is a closeness. There is a fellowship. There's an intimacy, listen to me, between us and the Lord Jesus as if we were born of the same womb. Wow. Interesting, isn't it? Write this scripture down. This is Psalm 68 and verse 5 and verse 6. What God does is he takes the solitary and sets them in families. Oh, you've got that on the screen. Thank you so much. He's the father of the... Let's go back to five. Here we go. Okay, we've got it amplified. He's the father of the fatherless. He's a judge and protector of the widows, is God, in his holy habitation. Now, here's what he does. Verse six, look at this. He places the solitary. You ever been solitary? You ever been all alone? You ever feel like you're just, you know, you're just doing life by yourself? Well, the good news is God specializes in taking the solitary, and placing them in families. Everybody say families. And he gives the desolate a home in which to dwell. And he leads prisoners out to prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a parched land. Go back to verse 5, please. He's the father of the fatherless, a judge and protector of the widows. That's what this God is. In his holy habitation, he takes the, the, the solitary, the lonely, those who are all alone, and he sets them, verse 6 says, in families. How many of you have discovered since you've come to know Christ that he has placed you in a family? Amen? He places us in a family. And he gives us, as desolate people, a home. And he leads us who are prisoners out to prosperity. But if you're rebellious, watch out. You'll continue to dwell in a parched land. Let me finish this, wrap this message up, if I may, with a few more thoughts. Almost always, the description of the church as God's family is regarded as a metaphor. Like, um, like the church is a temple the church is a field, the church is a bride. Those are metaphors. However, when you refer to the church of the living God as a family, it's not, it's not a metaphor. It's the real deal. It really is a family. God's household is the very definition of the church. It's not like a, we're not like a family. We are a family. Whether you like that thought or not, <laughs> You're part of a family now. And when I say family, your mind may go to this, this weird dysfunctional group of people like your weird uncle Al and your, your funky aunt Louise or whatever. And, and, and the craziness that happens whenever you gather at Christmas time, I don't, I don't want you to think of those things. I want you to regard God's family 
as a group of people who love and care and have similar purpose and similar designs and similar destiny. We are on the same road. We are heading in the same direction. Our purpose in this life is to give glory to God. Our purpose in the next life is to enjoy his glory. And let me tell you something. He sets the solitary in families. He says, I want you to enjoy this walk. I want you to live this walk in a family. I don't want you to be out here on your own. I never called you to be a Christian on your own. A Christian on your own is like a soldier without an army. It's like a football player without a team. God never called you to walk this life on your own. God's called you to live in, re in relationship, to live in community, to live in a family. Somebody say amen. So God's household is the very definition of the church. We are a family. We're not like one. We're not as a family. We are a family. Jesus, in Hebrews 2, 11, the Bible says Jesus is not ashamed to call us brother. There's that word that's used 139 times in the New Testament. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Can I just stop there for a minute, giving you time to take a picture of that slide? <laughs> Here it is. Because both the one who makes people holy, who makes people holy? Who makes people holy? God makes people holy. Are you with me on this? I really, want you to, I really want you to grab this one. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy, that's us, are of the same family. Woohoo! <laughs> Give me an amen or a woohoo or something. We're in the same family. The God who makes us holy and then those of us who are made holy. Made righteous, that's us. We are of the same family. And here's the, here's the kicker. Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Atafotos, born of the same womb. Wow. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family and Jesus is not ashamed. He is not ashamed to call you his brother. He's not ashamed to call you his sister. Well, pastor, you don't know my life. Surely Jesus is ashamed of me because I, I know others are ashamed of me. I really mess things up. You don't understand where I've been. You don't understand what I've done. You don't understand what I've, who I've done it to. I'll tell you something. Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother or sister. Hallelujah. Woo-hoo-hoo. Man, you may have given every other human being on the planet reason to be ashamed of you. <laughs> you may have given your family reason to be ashamed. Your, your, your mom, your dad, you're pretty sure they're ashamed of you. You're pretty sure that it's, that's the way it goes. You just live a life of shame and guilt and, and frustration and deceitfulness and, and deception and depression and hate and that, that's just the life you've lived but I got news for you once you become a child of God Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother and sister because you're in the same family as he is he's the one who made you holy you're the one who's made holy and you're of the same family wow I'm going to preach myself happy before this is done go with me to Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 I think I got this on the screen for you Romans 8 and 15 is talking about um, an adoptive process that, tra that transpires when you and I believe on the Lord Jesus. Here's what happens. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, if we are children, then we are, say it with me, heirs. Heirs of God and what? Co-heirs or joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. Sharing in the sufferings brings us to sharing in the glory. You've heard me preach, it wasn't too long ago, just a few weeks ago, I preached on the necessity of suffering and the importance of suffering and what it does for us and how it's necessary and how we're all going to go through it. And so, you know, nobody likes it. Nobody likes to talk about it, but it is a part of life and it's a part of our Christian walk and our experience and it's going to happen. And Paul is so bold as to say that when you share in his, Christ's sufferings, then you may also share in his glory. 
But what I really want you to focus on is the Spirit himself, the Holy Spirit, agrees and witnesses and testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if we are children of God, then we are heirs of God. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, we shall also be glorified together with him. Somebody say amen. Now look at the next verse, please, verse 16. Is it right there? All right. <clears throat> Did we got gotcha? it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sorry? Is that 15 through 17? Is that what it is? Wait, shake your head, Sabrina. That, that's it? I just read 15 through 17? Oh, good. Okay. There you go. Well, that's it. That's 15, 16, and 17 all wrapped up in one little bundle. Okay. 30 started to make a joke about bundling, but I better not. That's a commercial, and we don't do commercials. All right. So, so, so Jesus says, you've been given a spirit of adoption whereby you cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself testifies the fact that you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. What verse is that? I can't hear you. Aha, this is 15. Thank you. All right, all right. So I started on 16. Let me back up here and start on 15. You with me? Are we reading too much scripture? Is it too much Bible? I was told once I, I used too much scripture in my sermons. It was a, I think it was supposed to be a critique of me. I'm not sure if they were bragging or what. I don't know, but I, I think they're mad at me. Your problem is you use too much scripture. Okay, sorry. The spirit who <laughs> you received, how many of you received the spirit when you were born again? Sure. The spirit you received does not make you a slave so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought you about to you a, an adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. By him we can now declare what a, what a freeborn child could declare in this, in this culture. Only a freeborn child could use the word Abba. A slave child could not use the word Abba with his daddy. He had to use something else. But now we can cry, and Paul specifically put Abba in there before Father because he wants us to realize we are no longer slaves. We are no longer under bondage. We are no longer under, under uh, slavery or, or any of those kinds of things. We are freeborn. Once we're coming to, when we come to Christ, we've received a spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Hallelujah. And then we read verse 16, the Spirit testifies, we're children, we're heirs, sharing in the suffering, sharing in the glory together. Somebody say amen. amen. 15 through 17. Now, I told you we're wrapping this up, and I'm really trying hard to wrap it up. Mark chapter 3, verse 31 brings us to a in very interesting thought. Jesus is uh, teaching and meeting with some of his disciples. And so uh, his mother and his some of the others arrived, and they're standing outside the building where Jesus is. They sent someone in to call Jesus. A crowd would sit around him, and the crowd said, your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Okay? Now look at what Jesus said. The next verse, please. Which would be, I guess, 32. Who are my brother and my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and my sister and my mother. Wow. Did you, did you know Jesus said that about you? Are you doing God's will? Well, I'm trying. No, no, no. Are you living out God's will for your life? Yes or no? The answer should be yes. Yes, I am. Do I make mistakes? Absolutely. Do I, do, I, do, I, do I sin? Sure, I do that. Do I repent? Absolutely. Do I find forgiveness for my sins? Absolutely. When I confess my sin, is he faithful and just to forgive me my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness? Yes. Didn't say I was perfect, but I'm living the will of God for my life. And whoever does God's will is my brother, Jesus said, my sister, and my mother. 
In other words, I am in a familial relationship with you in the body of Christ that is a family unit. I want you to see this. I want you to grasp this. I want you to realize you're, that's why I started the message by saying, welcome home. Because when we all get together, we're the family of God. We're no longer strangers and foreigners. We're no longer, you know, pilgrims on some path. We're no longer old chunks of coal who are going to be a diamond someday. No, no, we're the people of God. Come on, that ought to make you shout. That ought to make you lift your chest up high and declare, I am the ch- I'm a child of God. And I'm in his family. Hallelujah. So, the family members are primarily are primary concerns of a healthy home. So it is with the church. Our first responsibility is to God's household. 1 Peter 5, 2, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care. The Old and the New Testament is full both of addressing hearts and relationships with God's people. And to have emotionally, listen to me, to have an emotionally and spiritually healthy um, uh, kids, children, you must be a healthy believer. To have emotionally and spiritually healthy marriage, you must be a healthy believer. To have a spiritually and emotionally healthy church, every member needs to be a healthy believer. I'm going to make a real bold statement. Well, there it is on the screen for you. Emotional health is necessary for spiritual maturity. Boy, preacher, that's pretty strong. I know. I know it is. But if you, here's a quote that I really want you to hold on to. I've got it on the screen for you. So you can take a picture of it or write it down or something. Write it with a crayon, whatever you're going to do. If this is Dr. Les Parrott. Dr. Les Parrott is a Christian uh, psychologist kind of a guy. I'm not sure what his title is. But he writes some fascinating things. And he said, if you try to build intimacy with another person before you have gotten whole on your own, then all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself. If I try to build relationships and I'm not whole on the inside, then every relationship I fall, according to this gentleman, will be an attempt to complete myself. And the Bible says we can only find completion in God, Colossians 2.10. And when we do find completion in him, we get healthy relationships and we live life to the fullest. You know, there's an old expression that says, two halves make a whole. That may be true in mathematics, but it's not true in relationships. Two halves don't make a whole. Two holes make a whole. <laughs> if you want a whole, healthy fulfilling relationship that will take you through the rest of your life, then number one, you get whole on your own. Listen to me. You get whole on your own, first and foremost. Then you can reach out to other people. If, I don't, if I'm not whole on my own, then, then my whole life is going to be spent trying to fill some vacuum and some void, and I'll be sucking from every relationship I have. I'll be like... <sighs> I need you to need me. I need you to help me. I need you to fill me. I need you to build me up. I need you to do something for me. You see what that does? So God wants us to get whole. Come on, somebody, get whole. (laughs) Well, that's another message for another time. Let's drop it right there, and let's stand, everybody. Here's what I want to do. I want us to pray together. I want us to ask the Lord to help us to reach out in godly relationships. I want us to ask the Lord to help us to be a, a, more, a more fulfilling member of his family. If he's called us to love one another and he's called us to be a family, most of us have missed the mark. If he's called us to build healthy, godly relationships, then most of us, we don't have that. We have a smile and we have a God bless you and we have a how do you do and uh, we, have a, we have a line when somebody asks how we are, we say, oh, fine, been great, thank you, which is not true. Most of the time we're broken, most of the time we're empty, most of the time we're hurting on the inside. I believe God wants us to get whole. I believe God wants us to have something to give to relationships. Because if I don't have something to give, then I will constantly be, be taking. I'll be getting. I'll be wanting you to, to, to satisfy me, meet my needs, tell me how wonderful I am, tell me how beautiful, tell me I'm pretty, do all these wonderful things for me. 
Why? Because I'm empty. God doesn't want you empty. He wants you full. I said he wants you full. Would you bow your heads, please, all over this room? The Spirit of God is here this morning. He's dealing with us really about family. He's dealing with us about relationships. He's dealing with us about intimacy. He's dealing with us about being whole. He wants you to be full. It starts with the, the fullness of His Spirit. Once you're full of His Spirit, then His fruit can begin to manifest. Once you're full of His Spirit, then His gifts can begin to operate. Once you're full of His Spirit, then you can begin to love other people. Once you're full of His Spirit, then you begin to manifest the nature and the love and the life and the liberty of Jesus Christ. Once you're full of His Spirit, people will see Jesus in you. They'll see Jesus in you. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> We've said a lot today. I have, and I've gone, I've touched a lot of, hit a lot of buttons, talked about a lot of different themes and subjects. I hope it all dovetails here together. As I just encourage you to reach out to God. Reach out to God right now in Jesus' name. The heads bowed, our eyes closed. Come on, just say this prayer with me. Just say, dear God, I need you like never before. I need the fullness of your spirit in my life. I repent. Come on, just say it. I repent of going my own way, of doing my own thing. I now want to do your thing. I want to know you closer than ever before. I want to draw close to you. I want you to fill my life in Jesus' name. Fill my life. Thank you, Lord. Sing it, Sherry, would you? Let's all sing with, with you this morning. Falling in love, Falling in love with, with Jesus. Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Say it one more time. Falling in love. Falling in love, Falling in love with, with Jesus. Jesus. The best thing, it was the best thing I've, I've ever done. Ever Amen. Would you agree? Come on, sing this chorus again. Falling in love. Falling in love. Falling in love with, with Jesus. Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. Falling in love with Jesus. It was the best thing I did. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. When I think of statements like, you know, this Holy Spirit, the Spirit bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God. And if I'm a child, then I'm an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. When I think of statements like that, and I realize he's, gone to all this trouble, dying on the cross, that I might be a part of God's family, because God wanted to build this family for himself. Whew. It changes the way I see myself. It changes the way I see others. It changes the way I see him. Oh God. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Work in me today, God. Work in me today, God, of your great love. Witness to me of your spirit, I pray. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. The one in this room who would say, Pastor, I, I think I think I really need salvation. I think I'm lost. And you don't know how to get found. <laughs> you don't know how to you don't know how to find Christ. Would you lift your hand? I want to help you. I want to pray with you this morning. Is there one here this morning you'd say, Yep, that's me. I, I need I need salvation. I need eternal life. <laughs> Maybe you don't understand those concepts, but your spirit, your heart is telling you right now you need a change. You need forgiveness. You need wholeness. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. If you're at home watching us and you're praying this prayer, and uh, you really mean it from your heart. Don't you get in touch with me? Let me know that you pray this prayer. Just message us there. If you're on Facebook, let us know. Or if you're watching on YouTube later on or something, 
however you're, however you're watching us today. Let us know that you prayed the prayer. If this ministered to you, God touched your life. I'd love to hear back from you, okay? Amen. It's time now for the blessing of the day. I want to give it to you. A pastoral blessing in the name of the Lord. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May angels go before you and goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a great week. We love you.